Good afternoon and welcome to Debating Europe's live debate here in the European Parliament with me, Joe Lidabaski. I'm the editor of Debating Europe uh, and we are talking about artificial intelligence today and I have a panel of experts and policymakers with me to answer some of your questions that you've sent us in on our website. Um, joining me today to my left is David Martin, um, who is Senior Legal Officer from Burke, the European Consumer Organization. Uh, next to him is uh, Jana Tom, who's a member of the European Parliament. Uh, she's from Estonia. She sits with the Liberal Renew Europe group in the Parliament. Next to her is uh, Tima Volken, who's also an MEP with the Socialist, uh, Socialists and Democrats group in the Parliament. Um, to my right is uh, Jim Dratwa, uh, who's from the European Commission, uh, who is head of Ethics in Science and New Technologies. And next to him is Charina Chow, who's Global Policy Lead for Emerging Technologies at Google. Thank you all for joining me. Um, Jim, I'm going to start with you. Sure. I'd like to start, um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about the, the benefits uh, and the, the risks. I think one of the most uh, controversial applications of AI is in facial recognition technology, which is why I'd like to kick off with that, start us uh, off with something controversial. So the question comes from Don, who's extremely positive about the benefits of AI in terms of facial recognition technology. He talks about how it can improve public safety, it can be used to um, uh, make the lives of criminals and, and terrorists very, very difficult. On the other hand, there are risks involved with the technology. Um, there are questions of uh, false positives, issues of consent, racial bias, and so on. And we've seen in the US some cities have decided to ban the technology altogether. So the, the question is, um, how do we minimize the risks when it comes to technologies like, like facial uh, recognition, and how do we maximize the benefits? Great, thank you so much. Um, fascinating topic, great question. Um, and let me just observe with you the strange framing in, in which uh, all of these questions are set. Risks versus benefits. We start with the technology and then we, we think, hmm, how can we make it more palatable, more acceptable? What if we reframe things? So what if, first of all, we reflected on not just the risks and benefits, mm. but the distributions thereof? And also, what if we didn't start with a specific technology, a specific application, but what if we pause for thought for a moment and really this, this key ethical question, what world? What world do we want to live in together? <clears throat> Oh, I, did I say we? I, I think I did. Mm. Okay, it, it can happen. Uh, it happened to me, it can happen to all of us. It's fine as long as whenever we say we, we just pause for a moment yes. and think about who's in that we and, and who's not. And how is that determined? And then really this, where are the others? That's a super important ethical question as well. Yes. So with regard to facial recognition, uh, let's pause for thought and think about how is power exerted with these technologies? Um, and let's think, is, is there a problem for which this is a solution? Um, so this is just to kickstart our reflection. Sure, sure. No, no, absolutely. And I, I suppose, okay, so let me come at it from a different um, angle, perhaps. So um, when it comes to facial recognition technology, uh, a, a lot of the pioneers in terms of this, uh, applying this technology are not actually in the public sector, a lot of them are in the private sector. It is, it is, um, uh, you know, bars or music concerts or um, uh, kind of shopping centres and so on, which are using smart CCTV cameras. So I suppose if I'm going to put it a different way, so you say re it's important how we frame this debate. Can we manage the risks when it comes to these? If, if you know, is this, these technologies are coming, um, and if we don't innovate, other countries will. Is you know, we is there a way for us to, to kind of get the most out of these technologies without? You, you're right. You're right. That the key is that we want to maximize the benefits, yes. have as much as, as we can, and we realize that they also come with risks, and, and we want to minimize those. Uh, so the the key question in in that regard. Uh, is who decides? Yes. Who, who decides who gets to benefit from this and who bears the burden of the risks? Um, so I'll put it to you who decides? <clears throat> who does decide? You're, you're right. So uh, at the moment, um, de depending on which part of the, of the world you look at, uh, certain uh, large corporations seem to, you know, 
to steer the, the, um, the debate and indeed the rollout of those technologies. In other parts of the world, um, uh, certain governments do so. Yes. And, and this really, thank you so much for putting it this way, it makes it very clear that what we need is a wide societal deliberation on this. It's not for um, certain corporate executives in um, you know, closed boardrooms yes. to make those determinations. It's not even for um, government officials, be they elected. This really calls for a wide social debate on what world it is we yes. want to live together. Yeah, which was your, your first point. I think it's an excellent right. point. Um, it, as a, a, a journalist, I suppose it, it worries me in terms of, um, like, you know, who was responsible. You know, I like to kind of have kind of concrete um, kind of point to someone and say this is someone who is held accountable and this is someone who's going to be solving it. But perhaps uh, it requires a whole of society debate. Well, let's bring in someone from a big uh, company. Um, uh, Karina, I'd like to sure. talk to you. And if I could just jump in on do. that previous Please question. Do. I really agree with the points that Jim said. I'd like to note that there are many other applications yes. as well. Of course. You know, we talked about some of the ones mentioned um, in security, surveillance, yes. things like that. Um, but we've heard from a lot of disability communities, mm -hmm. for example, who would see enormous benefit from using facial recognition. Uh, we've heard from communities looking uh, at um, search and rescue, missing persons. Um, these are all places where there's um, really a big benefit and potential for the use of facial recognition. Yes. Um, and I think to your question and um, what Jim raised as well, you know, who decides? I think this is super important. A lot of people should be involved and it should also likely be different compositions depending on the different applications. Okay. Let's talk about another application sure. of AI, which is because um, I, I sort of, I want to, when we talk about AI, it's such a huge thing. I want to kind of try to narrow it down a little bit. I know we only have half an hour to debate this, but let's let's try to narrow it a bit. Um, so I'm not an expert in AI, which is why I'm talking to you, but my understanding is that AI performs certain tasks better than others. It's very good at analyzing large databases, at pattern recognition, and, and so on. So when we talk about, we had a, the next question I want to, to uh, talk about is um, a question from Zap who believes uh, he, he, you know, one of the biggest issues facing humanity is yes. climate change. He says any solution has to be technology-led. Um, when we talk about AI, is climate change really the sort of problem that AI can address, given that uh, it seems not, it seems to be a problem where you need old-fashioned, you know, human solutions, political decisions, you know, we will not take the, the, the fossil fuels out of the ground, we're going to keep them in there, and that needs, to, that needs compromise, political elbow, elbow grease, and so on. It, can AI really help uh, address issues like climate change? Yes, I believe it can. And I would reframe the question a bit, completely sure. agree that uh, climate change, sustainability are one of the biggest you know, issues of our time. Uh, I would say rather than it being technology-led, it yes. is something that really can be technology-supported, Okay. Um, if that makes sense. So. Um, to give a couple of examples, when um, looking at the use of AI, as you mentioned, can really look for patterns in large databases. So using AI to maybe optimize existing processes, like looking at how electricity is distributed on the grid, that's something that may be able to be done more efficiently in many different systems. AI can help to really identify what those types of patterns and, and setups should be. Um, second area is really using AI to help identify new materials and new technologies much more quickly. So you think about solutions to climate change of course, there's political work that needs to be done. There's also new, um, maybe solar cell materials, new batteries, um, new uh, yes. types of materials for carbon capture. Yes. These are all things that, you know, if you do them brute force, it can take a very long time to go through the periodic table. But uh, machine learning tools can help identify optimal new materials for that. Um, and finally, the third point I'd raise is around kind of adapting to existing conditions. As we know, we can already see some of the implications of climate change around the world today. Um, we're starting to see you uses of machine learning to better predict things like floods, um, which are happening more and more frequently and to um, larger magnitudes of impact. Um, being able to predict uh, potential floods earlier um, can really help uh, identify what mitigations could be put in place and, and get people to safety more quickly. Okay, so I, I talked about how um, uh, Jim was saying it's a whole of society approach and I was saying, well, my concern is what about accountability? I'd like to bring in David on a question about accountability. Who is accountable? So this is from Ray, 
Ray raises an interesting point about the accountability of AI. He cites the example of when a self-driving car hurts a person, it's unclear who is uh, culpable and who should be punished. And we can think of other examples. Uh, AI has many applications. In terms of um, who the consumer is going to kind of blame or to, to ask compensation from, who's culpable? Uh, the designer of the AI, the person who's kind of operating it, the programmer, where's, where does the culpability lie? Yes, th this is precisely one of the one million question, uh, dollar questions that we have uh, around AI. And it's an area where we see that there's a gap in protection for consumers, actually. Because if we look at the legislation that applies to product liability, so if a product uh, is um, has a defect and harms uh, as a consequence, the consumer suffers harm. Who is responsible? Well, the legislation that we have is from 1985, and it doesn't cover software, it doesn't cover algorithms. We really need to rethink the rules of the game to bring those aspects into the regulation. We also need to think about precisely, there's a long product chain, mm -hmm. who's, who's responsible. Our thinking at the moment is that we should come from a perspective of a joint liability for all those that are involved in the process whose uh, activities have, have had an impact on the safety problems at the end. And in fact, we also should shift from the current thinking around the, the problem is in the defect of the product, but rather think about which are the safety risks and how those have materialized. And you look at those issues in terms of, and then you can try to go after who's responsible. For the consumer, it shouldn't really be that difficult. He should really have like different yes. people or even somebody who's clearly like his point of, okay, I'm going to complain to this person, to this part, and then they should sort it out among themselves probably. So that's why we think the joint liability is, is important so that the consumer it has an easy choice, let's say, when it comes to complaining. Interesting. Okay. Um, Jana, I have a question for you now, uh, which was sent in from uh, Prof Mahandas, um, who's worried about AI in the hands of authoritarian regimes. Um, for example, I uh, believe China has published a report saying it intends to be an, a leader in artificial intelligence by the year 2030. Um, at the same time, we know that uh, China has been deploying AI surveillance technologies in Xinjiang um, and uh, also that China is an exporter of surveillance technologies, exports to other countries. So you could have a negative application of AI spread uh, to other regimes uh, around the world. How can Europe kind of, I mean, Europe can try to govern what happens in Europe. But how can it ensure that uh, when we talk about risks and balances, it that may not be the right way of framing it. When we, when we talk about what sort of world we want to live in, how can Europe uh, make sure that, that the world that we're all living in is uh, one where AI is, uh, is used for positive good? You took away the starting point, which I, which I wanted to start with, yes, to, uh, to develop this uh, thing that this is a discussion about what is the future, who are we, and yes. what is the world? Yes. What is the definition of the yes. world, you know? Of course, the use of artificial intelligence, in my view, needs just kind of uh, agreement in a society. People have to be aware that they're dealing with artificial intelligence. They have to understand how, how the decision-making process is going there. It has to be transparent and so on and so forth. But we, of course, we cannot prevent uh, abuse from any regimes. It's absolutely mm. clear. Uh, it may sound kind of uh, not, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm not able to convince somebody, but you know, the first thing is that we have to promote, so to say, this healthy attitude to, uh, and uh, uh, non-abusive use of artificial intelligence and of course we, we just have not to sell certain things to these regimes. Yes. And this is also already in place if we speak about, for instance, I don't know, spyware. Uh, nobody, nobody will uh, sell it to... Uh, I, I'm not going to point anyone, mm. but this, this is already in place. But if I may come back to this issue, you know, I had a feeling that I did my homework. It turned out that I did not. Uh, I came here with knowledge that these things about who is responsible for, I don't know, car accident, they are already in place. I mean, why are we inventing the wheel? I mean, I this is covered by existing legislation today. Isn't the issue now that the wheel is uh, driving yes, itself? But, you know, uh, no, uh, than... no, this is about if, if it was pedestrian who ran in front of my car, yes. it is clear. And if this is a, uh, if this is a mistake in IE, then it's a problem of uh, those who produced it and so on. I mean, maybe for the future, but not today yet. David? Well, it depends on how you look at the problem, uh, how you identify. It. Can you say that the car that ran over uh, the person was defect, had a defect on it? Where, where is the defect? Uh, if it's the algorithm, it's not covered by the product liability regulation. <coughs> huh? 
I, I, I totally agree. The, the, the excellent points that uh, both of you are making, uh, it just because these systems are so complex, mm. uh, to say that the responsibility lies with the person who produced the AI doesn't quite uh, fly because there are thousands of systems involved. So cars, uh, communicating with cars, communicating with the environment. So it's not easy to put pinpoint where the responsibility lies. And here we're talking about responsibility only in the sense of liability. And um, the review of the product liability directive is, is, is underway uh, to see if it's perfectly fit for purpose or if certain adjustments uh, need to be made. Um, but then there's, of course, the deeper question about responsibility. Uh, which is that if we make certain socio-technical choices, uh, if we bring our societies uh, to certain uh, situations, who's responsible for that? Mm. Who's ultimately accountable for that? But I think maybe this is something that you'll take up with that, Timo. Yes, Timo. Um, I, 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 let's move on to another question from Catherine. No, 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 but let me just con continue on, the, on this question. Please. Because the liability one is one of the most pressuring ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, we in the European Parliament will deal with it, uh, with a one or more, I don't know, reports for the jury committee. It's indeed preparing a report on the question of who's liable, liable for mistakes uh, used when AI technology is used. So indeed, this is, it, there are so many people who could be liable, the one who wrote the code, the one who used it, who, the one who, I don't know, pro produced it, uh, the product. So there's, there are many, many actors who can be liable. So it's, I think it's very interesting to look at this issue. And um, yeah, so uh, that we in the European Union have legislation in place for this very crucial okay. question. Yeah. I want to ask about transparency was, was raised by Jan. Mm -hmm. It's one of the issues you raised. And this is a question that comes from Catherine, um, who wants to know, uh, who would like to see greater transparency around AI. Um, code, obviously, is often proprietary and closed source. Um, so, so we can't always tell necessarily why AI is making the decisions uh, that it is. And even if it was open source, it's so complicated mm -hmm. that the average person wouldn't necessarily be able to, to tell anyway. <laughs> so what sort of checks and balances would you like to see in terms of transparency, in terms of kind of um, keeping the, the, the technology in the, in the right place, working towards a positive good. Yeah, indeed, transparency is absolutely necessary and an absolute precondition to use AI um, technologies. It's necessary for accountability, from my point of view. And uh, I totally understand that um, algorithms are also trade secrets, so tech companies are not very uh, willing to give insights to it. But we need some public scrutiny of these algorithms. And uh, I, I'm afraid I do not understand how they work. But I understand which results an algorithm produces. Mm. And I think it would be smart to check uh, results of algorithms. And if we detect or see that there is discrimination or something like this, the, we should have the power to intervene. But I think it would be. Uh, it would be impossible to screen each and every code of AI uh, before it's released to the public and used. Who should do that? So I think it's impossible to do that. But if we uh, observe that results of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, of uh, AI code, yes. are indeed discriminating or something like this, we need to act. And we need then the power to be allowed to check these codes. Yes. And for that, we maybe need to adapt our intellectual property rights to be fit for such questions. And uh, again, this we will have a look at the question of intellectual property rights and AI code in the jury committee uh, because we are convinced that we need clear legislation on that because this is uh, a very the, one of the biggest questions for, for the next years and so uh, we need to look at the liability issues and of course uh, we need to check if our intellectual property yes. rules are fit for this purpose. So you say you're not an AI expert, can we bring in Karina here, um, this question of transparency and how 
complicated AI is. Like yes, and I agree with Timo. I think it's very important for a number of reasons, including accountability. Um, a couple of points that I would raise, you know, the, it was discuss the proprietary nature of some algorithms, which is true, of course, there are some um, trade secret considerations, but there's also considerations around security and mm. privacy. In many ways, when you have an algorithm, whether it's from a company or government or otherwise, you may not necessarily want bad actors or others to have complete access to that code um, for the those reasons. So I think there's a bunch of considerations there. That being said, explainability, really understanding what's happening is very important. At the company, it's important for us for a couple of reasons. One, debugability even. Mm. When we get a problem, let's say in Google Translate, um, we need to be able to understand what went wrong so we can fix it and try to make sure it's better for the next time. Um, Timo brought up the point of testing. I think being able to test both internally and externally is very important. Ahead of launching or, or ahead of products being available, of course, important, but also important is afterwards, right? Because there's so many uses that you could not even predict at the time. So being able to provide that testing is um, very important. We're making some progress there's um, ideas for example in uh, something called model cards and data cards which you can think of almost as a nutrition label for what's happening inside of the model just as with food you can understand how many calories how many grams of sugar how many grams of fat yes and um, we can try to do the same thing with what's the performance of this on different types of data set how many false positives how many false negatives yeah. I'm really trying to provide more transparency in that way while still being able to protect underlying code um, and then finally I think the last point on I'll make there's nothing inherent necessarily about machine learning systems that says they should never be understandable in fact yes. I think there's a lot of progress being made in trying to understand how uh, machine learning systems are coming to certain decisions so for example being able to predict tumor cells on an image um, we're starting to get some new techniques now to identify hey it's these cells and it's because of these features of the edges of the cells or these data that we learned from um, to be able to understand and in many ways in fact uh, my husband is a is a doctor and sometimes even human decision making right is a lot based on intuition yes. um, there are opportunities to use machine learning to actually provide better explanations than we have today may i Jim, just and then on, I'll come to on you. that building on that um, so very often uh, we're presented algorithms as um, you know optimized in such a way that unfortunately they can satisfy um, certain values and, and fundamental rights. Uh, uh, it's a really good example that shows that, indeed, it's absolutely possible to do so. Mm. So um, if rather than seeing ethics and values as stumbling blocks on the way of progress, we do take them as a moral compass, yes. as really uh, showing us the way, then we can say, OK, great, we want explainability. And then this has, this has uh, led, in, in the last couple of years, to a whole new generation of, of algorithms, of AI, if, if you will, um, who are able to satisfy uh, these sort of requirements. It's, it's often really useful, because otherwise we're stuck with a strange um, you know, and satisfactory metaphor of transparency. I don't know if every, anyone's ever bumped into a glass window. It shows how, uh, you know, sort of, absolutely uh, you know, improper this yes. is. Uh, but to disentangle between uh, the data yes. that feeds into the algorithms, the algorithms, the, the, the black boxes themselves, and then the results, the decisions, and ultimately the outcomes. Uh, and there we can see that there are interventions around bias, yes. for instance, uh, but also around uh, what we may call bias in our world, sure. which is you know, forms of inequality yes. that yeah. may be uh, addressed and remedied. Uh, quite apart from what we may do around artificial intelligence. But I'm struggling with this because, so I th and everyone, I think it's a huge new technology, it's a massive new field that's going to impact all areas of life, but the things I struggle with, I, as a journalist, I like someone to hold it to account, I like transparency as a way to frame things, so you're saying the way we need to think about AI is completely different. Um, but isn't that a way around accountability and transparency? Isn't that sort of just no. kind of diffusing responsibility and then... It's a great point you're making. There, there are quite a few things uh, around us in society which we can gain a lot by thinking about differently. Uh, but, but you're right. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, and then at some point... Uh, I don't know, here, viewers at home think what exactly is meant by this. Yes, uh, but of course. New, new technologies um, should be held to the same uh, standards yes. as, 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 as all of the, the other things yeah. that are currently around us. Uh, and, but, but, but by the same token, uh, let's pause for thought and look around us in the world, not just at new technologies and how can we do 
uh, a bit better in, in that respect as well. David, you wanted to come in on this. <clears throat> yes, I just wanted to say that these topics, uh, accountability, transparency, they are key from the consumer perspective. And when it comes to transparency, we have to think uh, th about this in the way that a consumer would think about it. Uh, I mean, it, it's true there are complex issues, but for them, the answer has to be simple. Basically, they want to know what's going on. So what's going on with my data, which are the criteria that are being used to determine a decision about me, what can I do about it if the decision is unfair or if wrong data has been used. So you have to really find a way of explaining all that mm. in a way that the consumer can understand and do something about it. We don't want uh, the source code uh, or, or algorithm to be Which disclosed yes. or anything like that. Yes. We don't need that. Yes. From the point of view of uh, accountability, uh, the issue of auditing, which was brought in, is fundamental. I mean, we need to find a way to audit all these algorithms uh, which are deployed in certain areas. We don't need to audit probably all the algorithms. We need criteria to say, okay, uses in this area yes. uh, should be audited because it's important from the point of view of the impact on fundamental rights or on society or on the individual as such. So we need to find independent third parties or public authorities that audit these algorithms. I think in the future, um, auditing of algorithms could be as important and necessary as financial auditing. So here's... Does, is that feasible? So, it, And would that be a block on innovation? If everyone has to register their algorithm, I mean, because, so this is a technology which is, you need enormous resources, but presumably the, the kind of barrier to entry is going to go down as the technology kind of spreads and becomes more common. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it feasible to have um, an, a, a kind of a government body or whatever, a, a, if it could be self-regulation, whatever it is, kind of auditing Algorithms. Can be a government body or independent okay. and third parties. I think it's feasible and it shouldn't be a stumbling block. I mean, think about the data protection legislation. You have this uh, thing called the data protection impact assessment based on the risk of the data processing. So for certain, uh, certain algorithms which are risky uh, for the consumer in certain areas, you should for example, go to a, an authority that tells you, okay, it's okay that you use facial recognition here, or it's not okay that you use it here, but uh, you have to tell me what you're doing with this and that. So it's really something that is important to do it before the technology is deployed uh, in certain cases. Interesting. The other point I wanted to mention very quickly is uh, it's about redress. So we need to make sure that consumers can do something when they are being treated unfairly or they're being subject to a decision that is wrong. And we were talking about bias and all that, so this is, goes into okay. the core of, of all that. Yana, you wanted to... Uh, yes, I, I also wanted to speak about transparency. Let's be honest, we can... Uh, it's a matter of trust. Uh, the thing can be very transparent, but you have to be able to understand yes. what, what is in the box. I mean, and uh, Karina spoke about uh, her husband, who is a doctor, I understand, yes. It's a really good example, you know. There are certain uh, robots which are doing surgery better than people. But there are also some patients which are extremely uncomfortable with yes. that. They just don't want machine. Yes. They, they, want, they want a person. But on the other hand, we have an example of a robot psychologist yes. who are kind of preferable for if you speak to a robot, you don't have the feeling of something, somebody judging you. Uh, so it's, it's, it's about the trust in, in the society as, yes. as such, you know. So definitely all kind of audit and uh, human oversight is extremely important. But this is a matter of trust in the society. And uh, when you mentioned some governmental organs, uh, you know, it make me like really careful. Yes. Uh, I'd prefer uh, somebody else to do so, even in European Union. Yes, 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 yes. Um, the agency is coming up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I mean, this is uh, talking about it. I mean, it really does come back to what Jim kicked us off with. It's about what kind of world we want to live in, and also it's about having the the conversation now. I suppose because a lot of these technologies are in the pipeline; they're going to come. So it's good to kind of have this this debate now. Um, Karina, I want to put a question to you from Helena, which I think sort of gets to the to the heart of this. She believes there should be limits when we implement AI. There are some applications which are just unethical. Um, even, and we have seen already in, in San Francisco, where you're, you're from, uh, which has banned, I think, police use of facial recognition, which is the topic that we kicked off the debate with. Um, so she says that even if it's more convenient to have AI perform, perform certain roles, uh, there needs to be, uh, we need to decide as a whole of society approach, this is not acceptable, this is acceptable. Um, what do you think of, of her assessment? Are there there's some limits, some things that we shouldn't allow AI to do? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. 
like other technologies, right, this is something that we should be using as humanity to help us get better, maybe perform more things, solve more problems, scale to more people than we could otherwise. Um, but it's not something that we should just let um, kind of develop on its own. There's got to be human participation throughout the entire thing. For example, you might imagine there might be some calculations or predictions mm. that are being made um, that maybe a machine can do better, but for the sake of human dignity or for the sake of human jobs or other things, we still always want to have a human as part of that decision-making process. Um, these are really things, to Jim's earliest points, that we've all got to be part of the discussion in, in making decisions. Okay, um, we're running out of time now, so I want to kind of wrap it up. Um, does anyone, Timo, did you want to have a, a final point, anybody? Otherwise, we're going to finish it here. Okay, um, we are done. I mean, I could have gone on and on and on, I'll be honest. We, I think we only scratched the surface, um, but uh, it, we will be continuing the debate on Debating Europe. If you have more comments and suggestions, please log on debatingeurope.eu. Leave your comments on the, the debate. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for taking part. Um, and thank you for watching.